So dear Sonia Batya, uh, respected uh, Peter Brabeck, uh, also people from parliament, Vice President Alena Gajdushkova of Czech Parliament, and uh, also distinguished guest. Uh, I would like to open this uh, small ceremony of responsible capitalismus, and first I would like to invite Alena Gajdushkova for opening speech like uh, house major. <laughs> Dear Mrs. Butter, Mr. Brebeck, ladies and gentlemen, they say that once means not at all, and twice is a habit. So welcome here on the soil of the Senate of the Parliament of the Czech Republic at this second uh, lecture in the series on responsible capitalism. It is a very rare occasion to have Mrs. Sonia Batyava here, who is the spiritual mother of this uh, series of lecture. The aim of this series is to cultivate the Czech uh, business environment in the spirit of Tomáš Batya. This uh, conference this year is uh, a symbolic opening of the celebrations of the 100th anniversary of Tomáš Batya Jr. Uh, the date is in September, and I'm very proud that here in the Senate of the Parliament of Czech Republic, uh, we can contribute to these celebrations. Tomáš Batya Jr. succeeded in putting the Batya company back on its feet after World War II and to turn this company into a global corporation. He said the measure of success is not a pile of gold. Wealth is in education, in moral principles, in freedom, in an open mind. And um, I had uh, an opportunity to visit uh, the Kenya Butter Company in Nairobi, and I could see that the companies in the world are an example of business security. The success is uh, supported by high commitment of the employees who are united in their striving for profitability, but also by sensitivity, engagement in the region where the factory, where the company is. And those are the characteristics of responsible capitalism. This company strategy has proven to be a positive one also today in modern management. As Deloitte and Touche have pointed out, technologies today are accessible from any part of the world. Uh, it is possible to um, acquire financing, uh, although it might not seem so at the first glance. But what is most important are people, creative, loyal, highly motivated, who share values and visions of society. In the Bacha company, this was understood as a matter of course. It's a company of sharing employees as partners, co-entrepreneurs, and this is how it was in Zlin. This, however, is a theme that will be discussed by more qualified people than I am myself. So once again, thank you, Mrs. Bata. Thank you all for coming here this evening. And I wish you all uh, inspiration from this evening. I wish you success in your work, in your business activities, and happiness in your lives. Enjoy the evening.
Thank you. I have to say that Sonia Batya is honoris causa of Thomas Batya University. Dear Dr. Sonia Batya, could I ask you to come here and say a few words? Ladies and gentlemen, tonight it is a great honor for me and a great pleasure to be here in this historic room. And I would like to thank the many people who helped, but very, very specifically, I would like to thank Evela Gajuskova, whom I know well, and though we have problems with our languages, we understand each other very well and we have the most wonderful cooperation and I would like to express my extreme gratefulness for all the help I received from you. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> the the Barashu Foundation established the Thomas J. Butler Lecture Series on Responsible Capitalism shortly after my husband died. The concept was to commemorate his dedication to responsible entrepreneurship and service to society. He considered that business must have a strong culture and values in which we believe. Such a business would be able to produce and distribute shoes to protect people's feet everywhere, but above all, the business would create many jobs, particularly in the developing part of the world. He insisted that the Bata employees continue their education by taking improvement courses on company time. He promoted entrepreneurship by empowering employees to make decisions. Moreover, Bata companies encouraged the creation of schools, of health, of sports, of social facilities. These initiatives enabled employees to advance their own career. They could provide their children with a better education and in this way, the well-being of employees as well as their entire family was enhanced. My husband, following his father's footstep, often stated that he did not see the business as a vehicle to sell enrichment. But rather, he saw business as a public trust for improving the lives of not only the employees, but also the customers, the associates, and those who lived in the communities in which the butter companies operated. We are a family business, and fortunately, the tradition continues. And I'm pleased to see that my son, who is chairman now, is with us tonight. Business has a much wider social purpose and value than just making money. In the proper hands, it can be a real force for good. We need a new generation of leaders who embrace the need for transformational change and possess the commitment and the tools to see it through. The lecture series on responsible capitalism introduces you to some of these outstanding individuals who really are making a difference in the whole world. On previous occasions, we were honored to hear Ratan Tata. Mohamed Yunus was actually in this hall. Paul Polman was in Toronto, sharing their experiences. Tonight, we are indeed very, very fortunate that Peter Breck agreed to be with us and share some of his experiences tonight. The achievements of Nestle and Peter Brabeck personally have made a significant impact, not only in a local area, but all over the world. Thank you. So in 2007, Thomas Batya was awarded by a special lifetime achievement award with the award of responsible capitalism by Forst. 
which is a multidisciplinary international organization situated in London. Unfortunately, a year late in 2008, Thomas Batya passed away at the age of 93. At the very same year, Thomas Batya established the Thomas Batya Lecture Series on Responsible Capitalism. The lecture series was inspired by Mr. Batya and by Batya family's strong belief that business is a public trust that should contribute to the well-being of the communities in which it operates. The lectures are sponsored by Dr. Sonia Batya, and all thank you very much, and also the Batya Shoe Foundation. And it's organized by Thomas Batya University in Zlin and by Schulich School of Business of New York University in Toronto. In alternate years, each university holds the lecture and so the series moves from Canada to the Czech Republic and back. In the four years, we have had highly respectable personalities. As mentioned, Sonia, the fourth year took place in Toronto with the Mr. Ratan Tata, the head of India's largest business conglomerate, Tata Sons Limited. Second season here in Prague, in this room, we introduced Professor Yunus, Nobel Peace Prize winner and founder of the Grameen Bank in Bangladesh. Third speaker again in Toronto was Paul Pullman, Chief Executive Officer of Unilever, one of the largest consumer products companies. This year is even more special since the shoemaker of the world, Mr. Thomas Batya, would celebrate his 100th birthday. Therefore, this year we are preparing celebration focus on this occasion on September 17. This day, an exhibition called Mr. Batya, Shoemaker to the World, will be open. The event will continue with orchestra of the Bohuslav Martinu Philharmonic Orchestra in Music Hall, be careful, in Zlin. However, this is near future. Today, we have pleasure to have with us distinguished person, Dr. Peter Rabek Lehmann, Chairman of the Board of Director Nestle. Dr. Rabek was born in Austria. He graduated at the University of World Trade in Vienna with a degree of, in economics. He has received several awards, as for example, Schumpeter Prize for Outstanding Contribution in Distributive Innovation, Austrian Cross Owner for Services to the Republic of Austria, or some specific exotic prize, La Orden Mexicana del Aquila Azteca, most important award in Mexico. By the University of Alberta in Canada, he was conferred honorary degree of Doctor of Laws. He serves as member vice chairman or chairman of several boards of global companies. So we believe that you will have a unusual experiences for only a select few. So, Dr. Rabek, it's a good time for you to deliver your speech, and we are really waiting for your nice presentation. Thank you. Well, first of all, thank you for this very kind introduction. Uh, dear Sonia, thank you for inviting me to deliver this year's lecture on responsible capitalism in this wonderful city of Prague. And Elena Kastuskova, thank you very much for allowing us to use this historical room, wonderful room here at the Senate of the Czech Republic. To begin with, 
ladies and gentlemen, if you allow me, I would like to share a few reflections on Nestle and Pata. When I think of the beginnings and history of Pata and Nestle, I cannot help but draw parallels between the two companies. Both companies were founded in the 19th centuries by, I think we have the right to say, visionaries who aspired not to make money, as it was mentioned by Sonia, who aspired to make a positive impact on society. But by doing so, they created big global enterprises. And this lecture series is inspired, as we have heard over and over again today, by the Pata family's strong belief that business is a public trust that should contribute to the well-being of the communities in which it operates. So as I studied the history of your company, I learned that Pata built housing, schools, hospitals around its factories for its workers and for their families, demonstrating Thomas Pata's firmly held belief that business should serve the public. And it was the same belief, ladies and gentlemen, that underpins Nestle's corporate business strategy. We believe that for a company to be successful over the long term and to create value for shareholders, it must also create value for the society it serves. And we call this creating shared value. Value for shareholders, value for the society. Nestle, with its headquarters in Weber, Switzerland, was founded in 1866 by Henri Nestle, a man who was not only a political refugee, as I mentioned in the afternoon, but a man who put nutrition at the heart of our company since its very beginning. Today, with the world's largest private nutrition and food research capabilities that there is, Nestle has become the leading nutrition, health, and wellness company of this world. In a moment, I will explain how this focus on nutrition is a fundamental part of our pragmatic approach to what you call responsible capitalism and how it is a fundamental approach to what we call creating shared value. What does it mean, responsible capitalism? What does it require? Well, I'm sure you have your definitions. Let me share mine. First, I think responsible capitalism, to me at least, is a product of responsible companies, but also of committed leaders. And let me share what I believe are some of the characteristics of these companies and leaders, drawing on our own experience, creating shared value. The role of responsible companies is not only to manage and grow the business profitably, and profitably over the long term, and providing attractive returns to its shareholders, but they do so by listening carefully to and respecting the communities in which we act. Deeply understanding and addressing their societal needs. Responsible companies must identify societal issues that are material, and that's important, that are material to our business, to your business. They are societal issues, but they are material to your business and report back transparently on progress in addressing those societal uh, goals. And to make this possible, the role of business leaders is to make stakeholders' engagement in a systematic process, engaging actively with NGOs, not afraid of having close relationship with them, who sometimes are our biggest critics, with governmental and academic stakeholders, and developing this keen understanding of relevant societal issues of our societies. So top management in this new role 
must go beyond the historical boundaries of a traditional business leader's role and join political and societal leaders in drawing much needed attention to these critical societal challenges, such as, for example, water scarcity, poverty, or the double burden of malnutrition, including both undernutrition and overnutrition, to name just a few which are relevant at least for my company. So business leaders must take a step beyond giving back. I will come back to this idea about we have to give back to society. I don't think that's enough. I think it's not enough to have a commitment to philanthropy, which by the way I believe should be done with the person's money and not with the money of my shareholders. I do not believe that corporate philanthropy of a public company is the right thing to do. Philanthropy per se is certainly positive and very necessary and can help address societal challenges. But it is rarely sustainable and changing direction with every leadership or with every economic crisis. Creating shared value is by its nature sustainable since it is intimately linked to the success of the core business of your business. And finally, top management must challenge the status quo, particularly the short-termism of financial markets and the insufficient inclusion of material, environmental, social, or governance issues in investment analysis models and reports. For responsible capitalism to take really root, we need the engagement also of the investor community. And that's not so easy to achieve. Now, how came this creating shared value all about? And allow me to make a, take a step back and describe the history of how we created this idea about creating shared value at Nestle. Is it quite clear that as a consumer goods company, we must closely follow and deeply understand the issues that affect in daily life our consumers and the communities in which the consumers live. And Nestle's history of working to address societal needs stems back to our roots when our founder, Henri Nestle, developed and launched his farine lacté, which was the first infant formula, a combination of, at that time, cow's milk, flour, and sugar, and thus saving the life of the baby of its neighbor. At that point of time, 147 babies died in Switzerland out of 1,000 being born. This is worse than what happens in the most underdeveloped country today in the world. And it was this societal issue which made him create the company into which we have been developing. So this is why nutrition is such a cornerstone of Nestle ever since. And with all the protests we had and with all the boycotts we had, people never understood that Nestle would never give up its commitment to infant nutrition. We would be giving up the roots of our company. Of course, at that time, Henri Nestle didn't call this creating shared value. He was just doing it. The development of this concept of creating shared value dates back to the 2005 World Economic Forum in Davos. And some, I know, were there. At that, the main topic at this meeting was corporate social responsibility. And the 2,500 people that were up there in Davos had only one thing to say. We have to give back to society. And we had Sharon Stone standing up and uh, committing the people for two million in order to give back to society. And Angelina Jolie was there. Mm -hmm. And everybody was there trying to give back to society. So on the fifth day, after I had listened to all my colleagues, I stood up and said, excuse me, but I want to tell you something. After having listened to you now mm -hmm. for five days, I will still say, I have nothing to give back to society because I have not been stealing anything from society. 
I have created value for society through the way how we have been running our business. And this is what we call creating shared value. And you can imagine there was a little bit silence in the room. Some people booed, some others looked more surprised and astonished. But this meeting forced me afterwards to really think more about this concept of corporate social responsibility as it was presented there, as this obligation, you have been doing something wrong and therefore you have to give back. And I approached uh, Michael Porter and Mark Kramer, professors from the Harvard Business School and the Harvard Kennedy School respectively, and they asked them to go completely independently to Latin America, where Nestle had been working for many, many years, like your company has been working for many, many years, and to make an analysis whether we were able during those 80 years of work in Latin America to create value for the society, yes or not, by doing business. And they came back and we reported their learning in our first Creating Shared Value uh, report which was co called the Nestle concept of corporate social responsibility as implemented in Latin America. And we refined together with the two professors this concept about creating shared value. And we officially launched Creating Shared Value as our approach to business at our first Creating Shared Value Forum at the UN headquarters in New York in 2009. It was a very important moment because we had to make one decision. If we kept creating shared value as a concept exclusively for Nestle, it would have died as a marketing gag, at something that was a public relation trial. That was the reason why we asked really Michael Porter and, and Mark Kramer to become and to assume the spiritual leadership of creating shared value. And they have propagated this system and this approach to corporate social responsibility all over the world. And today, there are more than 40 countries which recognizes creating shared value as the concept for corporate social responsibility for public companies. Now, what's the business case at Nestle? As I said before, the terminology is new, but the business model is old and has been practiced by our predecessors, like it was mentioned before, at Pata or at Nestle. And it was really born out of our own history and experience working in our case with farmers in the rural communities, using resources more efficiently across our value chain, or developing products and services to meet the real needs of the poorest of the poor. With products that are both tasty and healthier and with information that help consumers make informed choices. As you can see, this is a little bit more than just being a good corporate citizen. So our creating shared value model calls upon a company to specifically identify those focus areas where shared value can be really optimized. And this area is different from company to company. In the case of our company, it was in the area of nutrition, of water, and rural development. So societal issues represent an opportunity, not just a threat, an opportunity to develop new products and services, an opportunity for innovation, an opportunity to reduce costs while improving the environmental footprints, an opportunity to reduce risk and increase the sustainability in the supply chain. So business leaders have to take a 360 degree view of the world around them and in so doing, unleash opportunities and reduce risks. Allow me to elaborate on each of the three focus area. And let me begin with nutrition. Close 
to 900 million people live today still in chronic hunger, while at the same time another 1.5 billion people are heavily obese, have too much, and much too much. And not surprisingly, both are malnourished, with large parts of the population deficient in micronutrients. Now we are trying to help to tackle this issue by addressing the needs of both the overweight and obese population as well as the undernourished one. We feel that the world leading nutrition health and wellness company has an important role to play in offering the right kind of products and helping consumers make the right nutritional choices. And to achieve this, we use science-based solutions to improve quality of life through products, information, and services. And we also promote nutrition education, for example, such as better hydration, along with the benefits of physical activity, and thus contributing to the health and the well-being of consumers. And we have made a public commitment that we will sell. And I say sell. We are not distributing. We are selling. But we are going to sell, and we are selling 200 billion servings of micronutrient-fortified products to consumers by 2016. 200 billion servings. They have an impact. They are scalable. The second one is water. Ladies and gentlemen, this world is facing a water crisis just now. And there is a crisis which is linked to the grow global, growing global population. It's also linked to the increasing prosperity, the demographic shifts from rural areas to mega cities, and the impacts of climate change. If we do not solve this water crisis, food security and energy security both are at stake. With two-thirds of all fresh water used in agriculture and the demand for water set to rise by 50% by 2030 only, water scarcity is a clear scenario for a third of the world's population. So according to the United Nations, 783 million people still lack access to clean water. That's the latest figure. But the Third World Center for Water Management estimates that at least 3 billion people worldwide still drink water of dubious quality. And 2.6 billion people have no access to improved sanitation. So while we're recognizing very clearly the human right to water, which corresponds to exactly 1.5% of the withdrawal that we have, we also believe that we have to radically change the way we are using water, the 98.5% of the rest of the water, which is not considered to be a human right. And being the world's largest food and beverage company, we depend, of course, on reliable access to clean water and recognize that the long-term success of the company is built upon effective water stewardship. So, therefore, we are not only addressing the water challenge within our operations and also extending it to our full supply chain, but we are also working with others to share best practices, test new approaches, and find effective solutions. Internally, we have been able, just to give an idea, in seven years, to bring down the usage of water, which was 4.5 liters of water to produce one dollar turnover. In seven years, we brought it down to 1.5 liter of water to produce one dollar of turnover. And I think we have proven that we can and we have to act more efficiently, more responsibly in the usage of water, it can be done. The solutions, they exist. And through leadership and engagement with the Water Resources Group, a public-private partnership that I had created, Nestle is contributing to the water policy debate, discussing water challenges and proposing solutions by a high-profile and influential public forum. 
and through my personal water challenge blog, which I invite you to have a look and to participate because it's for me very important to get the feedback from everybody in this world, I hope to stimulate the discussion on important water challenges around the world. So I invite you to read the blog and share your comments and views to help us build and to develop a constructive conversation around this huge, huge challenge. Let me come to the last one, which is a rural development. Half of the world's population now live in urban locations, and this proportion is set to reach two-thirds by 2050. Just to give you one idea, the new Chinese government has put as one of the biggest priorities to urbanize 120 million of farmers in the next five years. Can you imagine the amount of people who are moving from the land towards the cities? It's an enormous, never seen before effort. So it's virtually, vitally important that with all this urbanization, with the environmental erosion, we have enough arable land in rural areas to feed this growing urban population who are reliant on food being brought to them and being grown by others. It has been estimated that 525 million farms exist worldwide, and they are providing a livelihood for about 40% of the global population. Small farms occupy about 60% of the arable land. And now comes an incredible figure. 75% of all poor people of the world are living in the rural area. The ones who have hunger are the farmers in the rural area, not the privileged citizens in the cities. And the issue is important to us as we rely on more than 5 million farmers to produce agricultural raw materials for our high quality foods and beverages. 5 million farmers gain their work just by supplying us with raw materials. And this is why we are working so hard to ensure that we source raw materials in a responsible and in, in a sustainable way. We have a direct contract, contact every single day with more than 690,000 farmers and we are also actively engaged in initiatives to address rural poverty and develop farming skills which are needed to make farming a more attractive occupation than what it is today. And we also work at community level as an integral part of our manufacturing and sourcing activities. Over half of our factories and employees in the developing world are located in rural areas as well as, of course, the farmers and suppliers from whom we source our raw uh, ingredients. So through our investments in factories and their surrounding infrastructure, we not only provide technical assistance and knowledge transfer, but also support economic development and improve the social conditions of the local communities, particularly in developing countries. And our coffee plants and our cocoa plants have as a prime activity the establishment of rural schools so that the children of those poor farmers have perhaps other options in the future. Let me come to the environmental sustainability and compliance issues which are part also of the creating shared value. Of course, in addition to nutrition, water and rural development, it is important to note that we see creating shared value directly linked with environmental and social sustainability. And none of this is possible without a very strong, strong set of values and principles. We have written down our corporate business principles, which are the foundation of our corporate culture, and describe our commitments to our stakeholders. So for us, Upholding compliance goes far beyond keeping checklists. What it does, it requires steadfast principles that apply across the whole company, across the whole world. It means respect for people. We talked in the afternoon about the importance for people that people have. 
people, our own employees, our suppliers, the people in the communities where we operate, and our consumers. So let me come to the conclusion. Let me come to try to summarize why creating shared value is such a great, pragmatic business approach. I hope you all agree that the creating shared value is based on business principles. Today, all business leaders have the opportunity to guide their companies in the creation of shared value. We have learned, and our experience has shown to us, that measurement and public transparent reporting helps to build the implementation momentum. External accountability and transparency around all those aspects of engagement in society. Since we have started to publish every single year a Creating Shared Value report in which we share our societal commitments, we measure our progress, we discuss the challenges we are facing. We are not saying we do everything perfect. We are saying there are a lot of challenges out there we have not been able up to now to tackle. But since we have published this, the whole organization, the 330,000 people of Nestle, have embraced it as something which is part of their DNA. And already today we can see that this level of transparency pays dividends, not only in terms of reputation with stakeholders, but also with the socially responsible investor community, and they are growing. They are still a minority, but they are growing. And the indexes that guide them. While much work remains to be done in the area of measurement and metrics, and we are working again with universities, this time with the university in the UK, to clearly establish the linkage between societal and business impact, there is increasing proof that creating shared value pays off. It is a good investment. And the recently published UN Global Compact Accenture study on sustainability, the world's largest CEO study with input from more than 1,000 CEOs across 103 countries, correlates transformational leadership with higher returns over time. The study has identified clearly that the small group of transformational leaders that are successfully managing to combine externally recognized sustainability leadership with significant market outperformance. You can get both of those things. And you had last year a speaker, uh, whom I know very well, he's, a, I think, a very good example how, for example, him, Paul with Unilever has achieved both things very well. He's one of those examples. The Roveco Samdo Jones Sustainability Index which analyzes the economic, environmental, and social performance of the top 20% of the companies shows that these best-in-class companies all deliver higher financial returns. The top list of the Dow Jones sustainability are those who are the best financially performing. And in studies conducted by the Reputation Institute, there appears to be a strong correlation between economic strengths and the sound reputation. So, ladies and gentlemen, I believe that creating shared value represents responsible capitalism in action. It is directly linked to the core business. It creates a direct relationship between business and society. It requires a long-term perspective for the company to deliver on both sides. And finally, it creates new and innovative areas of growth and profitability. It reduces risks, it improves your reputation, and simultaneously provides sustainable, scalable solution to big global societal challenges. So we only hope at Nestle and encourage more companies and businesses leaders to embrace this creating shared value model of responsible capitalism and help grow their business while simultaneously addressing societal needs. Thank you for the opportunity to explain to you what we mean by creating shared value, 
and I'm looking forward for the questions. Five ten minutes for discussion. Question, please. First question. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. My name is. Yes. yes. My name is Petr Sokol. I'm from CSR Consult. And Mr. Brabeck, I'm very happy you had a speech about creating shared value. I heard you uh, in May in Boston. Um, and I, I can see the global momentum of, of creating shared value all around the world. So it's great that it arrived in the Czech Republic. And I really appreciate your examples and I like examples of, of Nestle. And I, I, I very like the idea that social issues can become business opportunities. And I always wonder what is the best way to identify the relevant social issues for the particular business. And you mentioned several examples from, from developing countries. And I wonder whether you have some interesting examples from Nestle in Switzerland. What are the social issues that, that Nestle can respond to besides uh, obesity? Uh, what are the examples, for example, in Austria or in the Czech Republic? Because the examples you mentioned, we can imagine quite well in developing countries. But what is it in the developed world or in the countries like Czech Republic that is somewhere in the middle? Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. Um, yeah, I think this is, as I, as I pointed out in the beginning, that's perhaps the first and most important work you have to do. You have to, first of all, get an idea of what are the societal issues that are surrounding you, the community has. I mean, I'm sure when our companies were created, the question, for example, access to schooling, access to hospital, access just to have a home was something important. That's the reason why our predecessors built schools uh, and hospitals around the factories, because there was, there was none. So that was a societal need at this point of time. Now, this need you don't have today in Western Europe, for example, okay? But, you know, we just have uh, made a big decision. Uh, I talked in the afternoon about this. We have a big societal issue in Europe, a very big societal issue, which is youth unemployment. I think if you ask me, I think it's the biggest societal issue we have today in Europe. Because we are pushing a generation of young people in certain parts of, the, of, of, of Europe, like in Spain, like in Greece, 57% uh, unemployed, young unemployed. We are pushing them into a vacuum if they don't get a job in the next few months or years, they will never work. They will never have an opportunity to work. Because the time jobs will be created, the new generation will be there, and you will take the new one, and you will not take this one. It's, it's, a, it's a huge problem. Now, in the case of Nestle, we decided to launch a program where we commit ourselves in Europe, in Western Europe, to create 20,000 jobs for young people. 10,000 directly into the company and 10,000 additional apprenticeships. And we have started to implement this also here in Czechia. Because although it is not so dramatic as it is in some other parts of Europe, but it is an issue, it's a societal issue. So we can do that because we had apprenticeships before. Now we are just expanding it stronger. We have in all our factories possibilities to bring people into apprenticeships. We have it in the, faculty, in, in the head offices. So in the case of Europe, for example, our creating shared value has been broadened into the area of youth unemployment because it was a big and is a big societal issue today. And we felt we were able to do something about it. Now, I was a vice chairman of an of ophthalmological company, uh, Alcon, before we sold it. Now, we discussed about this, and they thought that where they could do most, of course, is helping to overcome blind people. And the Creating Shared Value Initiative was basically the commitment 
from our ophthalmologist to work every year six weeks in Africa in order to help people who were going blind, to help them, to give them operations free of charge. And the company helped him to do like this. So every company has to find out where it can really create the biggest impact on this shared value creation between the value for society, but at the same time the value for himself. There is no simple answer to that. But it's a critical part of the, of the process. Thank you. Okay, please. Next. Thank you very much, I'm Ferdinand Trautmersdorf, the Austrian ambassador. I would like to ask you um, a question concerning, I mean, the most important uh, tool to share value is actually shares, no? Um, so, and it's, it's your shares. So th the <laughs> question is, what actually is the productive sector? What are the most important companies doing in order to um, to, to restrict uh, the fact that the speculative sector is act actually uh, distorting the value of your shares that you are producing. That actually the, the, the value of the production is not necessarily anymore the, the value you share with your, with your uh, uh, shareholders. Does, uh, do you think uh, that it should be the productive sector should be uh, probably using its power um, in 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 more decisive manner in order to to limit uh, the specter the impact of the speculative sector or do you rely on on the public sector here um, I think it's a very 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 relevant question and uh, the answer is not very easy uh, first of all the financial markets of course have a role to play there is no doubt about it the question is, uh, where does the speculation start and the service function finishes? Yeah? For example, I mean, uh, after 2008, there was an idea that banks should not be allowed to speculate. Well, wait a moment, what is speculation? Is hedging my raw materials prices for the future, therefore assuring that the farmer has a stable income and I have a stable price for my raw materials, is this speculation or is this something, a service which I need? It's a service I need. So just to say, you know, banks shouldn't be doing this is not very helpful. The other question is when banks are taking money that we have saved from our saving, from our saving accounts and start to speculate with this money and leverage it out, well, that's a different type of speculation. This one I don't need. So that the, the, the thing with this financial service, the most difficult part of it is what is a, valid, <coughs> a valuable and necessary service and where comes the speculative uh, part in it. Excuse me. <coughs> the second one is <coughs> The financial, the financial markets will always be short-term driven. It's part of their business model. And I think this is very bad for the productive sector. I think the productive sector, in order to be successful in the long term, has to be long-term oriented. And this is where you get into conflict again with the financial sector. So why the financial sector would like to have, hopefully, monthly p and tele accounts, yeah? They're unhappy because they only receive every three months the p and tele account. Well, I don't want to give them this. Not because I have something to hide. But if I give them this, my internal organization is going to act on this obligation to give them every month a p and account or every three months a p and account. So we were very radical in that. The first thing I did was we rewrote the 
uh, <coughs> the statutes of our company. <coughs> Sorry. And we put in that the purpose of Nestle is the creation of long-term sustainable value. So we put in long-term and sustainable. So when I have now hedge funds coming to my office and complaining that we do not deliver quarterly profits, which we don't do, and we don't go to any stock exchange which demands from us quarterly profits, we don't go. I can tell them very simply, you shouldn't be a shareholder of Nestle, go somewhere else. Okay? We do not accept the pressure of the short-term financial markets and if they have an impact and the share price goes up and down, I don't mind because I can always come back to my shareholders and say, when you acquired shares of this company, you knew that you were looking for a long-term sustainable value. And we have been delivering for the last 20 years 12.5% total shareholder return in Swiss francs every single year. So we know that we have a compromise. But don't come and push me into a short termism and to, and to push me into, into this yo yo game of the financial markets. You have to be strong to do that, but once you have it, then I think you, you are free and to act differently. <coughs> okay, I, I think time is slowly going on and uh, I use my privilege, I still remember <coughs> getting the old, of course, approximately 50 years uh, ago, uh, my grandmother told me, as she said, what's the horrible time we have to pay for water? <laughs> and now you go to this situation and now we have free internet, we have free public transport somewhere, but we have to pay for water. You suppose we'll be, be able to get time, the water will be free, at least drinkable water? Well, let me come back to this question because I think it's a very critical one. The five liters of water that we need for hydration and the 25 liters of water that we need for our minimum personal hygiene is what we call a human right. No doubt about it. And I make any government responsible and it's a government who is responsible, that they assure that everybody, everybody has a right to this part of the water. Now, <clears throat> having said this, I come to where we are really using the water. To fill up our swimming pools, to water our golf courses, to wash our cars, to produce the agricultural products that we have to create the energy that we need. The 98.5% of the water that humans are being using and stealing away from the environment today, for me, this is not a human right. And because we do not give any value to water, we use it in such an irresponsible manner. That's why I say the first thing we have to do in our mind is to give water a value. How can you have a biofuel policy where we need 9,600 liters of water to produce one liter of biodiesel? One liter of biodiesel, 9,600 liters of water. You can only do it because you give zero value to the water. i give you another example and I will spell it out before somebody asks me about it. Bottled water. Big emotional issue. And I always ask the same question when I have mostly students and they, 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 they fight to me and say, how you are not allowed to sell water and bottled water and what the thing let me say. Now, if you think about it, the same person who fights and tells there should be no bottled water, okay? has absolutely no problem at all to buy a bottled beer from Mexico. No problem, okay? Or buy a bottle of wine 
from Chile or from California or from Australia. No problem at all. Or to buy a Coca-Cola. No problem. But a bottled water is like an insult. Why is it? Why is it? It's very simple. You give value to the beer from Mexico. You give value to the wine. You give value to a soda. And therefore, the packaging is justified. But you don't give any value to the water. And therefore, the packaging is not justified. It's as simple as that. If the water would have a value, if the water would cost $5, or like a vodka, we wouldn't have any problem with the bottle. It's just because we don't give any value to the water. That's the reason why we have these emotional discussions. Thank you very much. Now, please be a small ceremony. Mm. Time is over. Thank you very much. And on behalf of Sonia Bartel, I would like to invite you to neighboring room for small refreshment. Thank you very much more. Thank you, Peter. It was excellent. And I hope we will see you again.